Greetings, fellow humans. Welcome to Sam and Max Hit the Books. I'm Max. I'm Sam. And we're here with the uh, six books that we picked up on the 3rd of April, 2019. Uh, Sam, why don't you just take us right into it? Yeah, we're starting with uh, the issue one of The War of the Realms Big by Marvel Jason event. Aaron and uh, Russell Dwaterman. I actually don't know how his name is pronounced now that you mention it. It might be Dotterman, might be Dwaterman. Dwaterman. I I like Dwaterman. I do like his arc, though. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. This has some pretty good good art right from the beginning. I mean, the cover is one of those full splashes with uh, all the heroes that are going to be showing up and a bunch of uh, elf, dark elves, and uh, goblins, and uh, Malakath is a villain. Yes. So it kind of reminds me of Kefka. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I can see that. And, yeah, well, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, were you thrown off at all by the fact that in Marvel Comics, Heaven is now the 10th realm of the various Norse realms? <laughs> yeah. Because I forgot about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a little odd that there was a heaven there. <laughs> I uh, noticed, like, why is there a heaven and Valhalla? Right. Uh, the feasting hall of the gods. I mean, if, if you can choose between going to a mythical cloud harpland and the uh, feasting hall of, uh, of Odin, I mean, obviously you're going to choose feasting hall of Odin. I mean, we would. Yeah. And I mean, they have a hell. They've always had a hell. Right. Oh, yeah, no, they, they didn't have... They didn't have a heaven. They didn't have hell, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never read any of those comics where, mm. like, they brought in Angela from the Spawn comics and made her Thor's sister, who was taken to the Tenth Realm, Heaven, but anyway, moving yeah. on. <laughs> right. Okay. But you get a nice splash of the World Tree, Yggdrasil, and uh, the Ten Realms all together. You know, you got Muspelheim and Jotunheim, Land of uh, Ice Giants and whatnot, and, uh, yeah, Muspelheim is Fire... Jotunheim is ice. There's a uh, Alfheim. Alfheim, cool the light elf land, yeah. and wherever the dwarves are from, and yeah, yeah the realms. Older. They're cool places. And then uh, Odin dies. Odin dies. What, what a surprise! <laughs> Odin gets knifed to death. Seems like Odin's always dying. I know. I mean, it is a thing that Odin tends to do. Yeah, poor guy. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, yeah, Malakef brings uh, his. Uh, his lords of the realms to to come and have a battle, a war on Midgard, which is uh, the war, the the land of the mortals. Pretty good stuff. Loki shows up, but it might not be Loki. Definitely Thor finds not. him, yeah, because yeah, Loki's in there later, and uh, Thor, the dog, the best superhero dog. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! It's like, but wait, Master, it's not up. Oh, where'd you go, Master? Well, I think we may now have to record a debate episode about whether or not Thor is better or worse than Crypto, the super dog. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, Malika. Uh, one of the reasons why I was interested to pick this up is because we noped out of the most recent Thor run pretty quickly, mostly thanks to the art. Yeah. And uh, so we have not read literally any of the lead up to this event. Um, it was pretty clear. I was surprised that the Punisher was in it, like for the <laughs> right. pages he was uh, and how entertaining die. he was. <laughs> I, I loved that bit where he's like, ah, I'm going to just go shoot this ice giant with my pistol. I'm yeah. a super ripped Punisher. All right, Let's jump off a building. <laughs> no big deal. Donovan's bringing in these weird Dutch angles mm-hmm. during the action scenes. Which and... is pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, Spider-Man shows up and uh, he, he hangs out with uh, Thor's mom for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that was some good Spider-Man banter. I, I like Jason Aaron Spider-Man. Pretty yeah. entertaining. He's doing a good, good job. We're getting a lot of uh, Spider-Man uh, Parker bad luck. <laughs> right. <laughs> Man of Spiders. Yeah, and it's just, you know, it's a lot of heroes. They're showing up to uh, fight all these demons. It's uh, It should be a pretty good show. You know, Iron Man's there, uh, Captain Marvel, uh, She-Hulk, and uh, Captain America. They're all there. Wolverine will be showing up uh, he will be showing later up. on. <laughs> <laughs> you only got a, a, a single panel in this issue, but uh, more of things to come. Good stuff. Master of the Mystic Arts, he shows up too. Yeah, Doc, I like when Doctor Strange shows up, because when he shows up, he's very like, yeah, I'm pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Pretty fun. And uh, Thor, so he's uh, trapped in Jotunheim, uh, fighting waves and waves of ice giants uh, with all his hammers. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely uh, big event comic stuff. 
and I was having a pretty good time until I finished the comic and I turned the page to see how many tie-ins <laughs> are just part of Act 1. Mm. And I'm like, man, we're not buying any of these except for Venom. Venom so 13. I'm, I'm very curious as to how this event comic will hold up uh, without reading any of the tie-ins that are probably going to be meaningful. Yeah, it's tough when they want you to get like 15 other things. Yeah, this was my problem with the Marvel Annihilation event is that Annihilation was only six issues as this is going to be. But there are so many goddamn tie-ins so many tie-ins yeah like spider-verse i um, are getting that there too right so uh a little disheartening honestly but uh we'll see it was it was uh, i liked it i thought this was a, a nice uh, issue if uh, if it doesn't all fall apart due to uh other issues that we don't read uh, i'm hoping that it continues to be of this uh this fun fast-paced quality i give it a seven a seven all right I am going to give it a five, because like I said, I was kind of like, eh, another event, here's a battle, things are battling. I I would actually rank it lower, but the art is just so spectacular. But even that, by, like, the art started to get very samey, I felt, through the last couple of pages. Just like, all right, there's not that much, mm -hmm. like, variation in the things I'm seeing. Every page has the exact same color palette. Oh, that's um, true. So, I was a little underwhelmed, honestly. Alright, that's fine. I'm a sucker for, you know, Norse uh, mythology mm. tied into your superheroes. Yeah, this is, that's one of the reasons, again, why I picked this up when I was kind of on the shelf. Because I know that you're into, you're into that Thor stuff. Oh yeah, got the whole world tree. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, moving on to uh, The Green Lantern, issue 6. Uh, with uh, Grant Morrison and Liam Sharp, Steve Olaf on colors. And I just want to start by saying I am impressed with every issue um, how the art team of uh, Sharp and Olaf is so able to make everything look both modern and classic. <laughs> like, it doesn't look like any other comic you're picking up right now, color palette-wise or, like, art itself-wise, and I, I, it's just so perfect for the story. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. That's true. I ap appreciate the, the use of uh, thick, uh, dark outlines around your characters right? Uh, with, you know, the uh, complex but not too colorful backgrounds. It really works well, and, like, mm. you never look at a single page of this and are like, that's anything but hand-drawn art. That's true. Like, made so much effort went into every page of this, and it is a delight. Well, I am the coloring, too. I that, mean, 100%. You get that look with the uh, computer-generated colors. Yeah, absolutely. The, the coloring is so an excellent part of what's bringing Sharp's art out of this, uh, you know, really pushing it to the forefront. Yeah, I even got some cross-hatching in there. And cross-hatching. <laughs> so many lines, and he drew every single one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I really enjoyed the plot of this issue. We had a, a duel between uh, Hal Jordan and Adam Strange, where Hal pulled the old fake kill your opponent in a duel trick. All right, fake gun. <laughs> he killed. Man, I've seen that one. You know, <laughs> that's, that's an old. Uh, that's an old reliable. Oh yeah. Um, we finally get some interaction between Hal Jordan and Controller Moo, and I really enjoyed their conversation where Moo was so like, I know exactly why you're here and what you're here to do. And Hal Jordan was, yeah, you may have guessed my plan, and you're right, but like maybe you're not sure about how I feel now. Right. Now that I've been through all this <laughs> stuff. Right. And uh, things really escalate with a quickness, because like all of a sudden you're finding out about this U-bomb, which is you know the ultimate bomb. Probably stand U bomb probably stands for ultimate bomb. Yeah, um, bomb's gonna destroy everything, literally everything. Right, and uh, instantly, instantly, and it's on like a dead man switch attached to controller Moo because if he can't uh, bring order to the universe, then uh, he's gonna mm. destroy it. Yeah, I really appreciated having a uh, villain who's such a an order guy versus the Hal Jordan Green Lantern who's like the ultimate free will. Superhero, right. lawful evil, right? Exactly. Chaotic good. So true. You don't. You don't think Green Lantern's chaotic or uh, lawful good? Well, I mean, yeah, but Hal Jordan lawful good. <laughs> I mean, he's lawful, but <laughs> maybe he's more of a. He, he's probably more the the true neutral. I, I'm pushing him a little. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think Hal Jordan's a little mixed, but yeah, I, I really appreciate the. Uh, the, the contrast there. Yeah, that's true. You and, don't get a lot of lawful evil. 
And Hal Jordan sacrifices himself uh, using all the powers of all the Green Lantern Corps. All the rings of all the other Green Lanterns flicker out across the galaxy as the Guardians beam him the energy he will need to stop the U-bomb from destroying literally everything. And uh, he succeeds and is gone. And is gone. But how did he succeed? But how did he succeed and where did he go? And where did he go? And uh, we get a little memorial for him on Ran that Adam Strange delivers the eulogy for. And... uh, we get uh, the, the ring floating somewhere in space. <laughs> and I'm going to guess inside the ring we see Hal Jordan. That's We're, interesting. That's my guess. If he's in this green world. He is in this <laughs> green world. And I imagine to stop the U-bomb, you would have, he would have to, uh, through force of will, uh, will another universe into being <laughs> that the U-bomb could uh, then explode with him. Incredible. Incredible. That's so Morrison-esque. Like, I, I love that concept, and I now really hope that that is exactly what has happened here. Right. And then if it is the ring, if he turned the ring into a universe uh, to entrap the U-bomb within, uh, that could get pretty uh, multi-dimensional. That could. And the, just the fact that like the universe we see, wherever Hal Jordan is, appears to be like a very broken universe with like floating continents <laughs> and debris everywhere. And In this way, though. Uh, this, this, <laughs> this could be a ring-constructed world that's been devastated by a U-bomb from the regular dimension. Yeah. It also reminded me <laughs> of the beginning of The Gunslinger here at the end. Oh, interesting. In the wilderness of all this broken, dead, desolate green and then there's this ugly guy who's this this the one only person this one guy this one weirdo who appears to have maybe some sort of sock puppet on one of his hands <laughs> and uh, i've seen people online positing that this could be like grant decided to give hal jordan his own fifth dimensional imp that uh, this could potentially turn out to be because you know you've that got, would be something you've got mix of split lick you've got bat mite you've oh, got yeah. uh, these other imps and uh, yeah I've never I would, heard of any others those, but those two <laughs> there are more <laughs> but I'm struggling to remember what their exact names were I feel like others have even shown up in other Grand Wars and comics um, but we'll see that could be completely not what uh, this dude is I mean for all we know yeah this could be some sort of uh, ring construct as well <laughs> true um, but I really enjoyed this issue uh, quite a bit I'd give it an 8 yeah I'd give it an 8 as well I thought it was uh, fantastic excellent uh, moving on we have uh, the newest Justice League Wrath of the World Forger I uh Doug Snyder? Ooh! <laughs> you didn't say Zach this time, but it's no, Scott Snyder. Scott Snyder. <laughs> I knew it wasn't Zach. And uh, George Jimenez. Yes. The, the all-star of this issue as well. <laughs> That's true. Now, uh, if you remember, uh, there was a fake Superman who has uh, trapped the real Superman in his own prison dimension and uh, shown the rest of the Justice League a possible future where everything's grand and great. So jumping right in from there, we have uh, Superman. He wants to escape, but fake Superman won't let him and says, you gotta stop. There's uh, food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a little confused by that because he's like, there's another. There's a dimension that you can jump to where you would have food, but I know you won't go there, but stop jumping for that thing. Like I was very... <laughs> sort of confused by the exactly what fake faker man was <laughs> trying to tell Clark to do here. I feel like he's just like, stop jumping, walk over there, there's food. <laughs> um, but yeah, while that's going on, uh, Martian Manhunter and Hot Girl have uh, conversed with uh, the young little Martian boy and uh, found out that this world is a fake, or at least... Uh, it's not all that it seems. It's not all that it seems. It appears to me, if I'm following the story correctly, that Faker Man, who is revealed in both a twist I wasn't expecting and also potentially the most boring twist it could have been, <laughs> um, is in fact the World Forger. Is in fact the World Forger. Um, and he's created this world as like his masterpiece. It's his perfect multiverse. Right. That they could choose to replace the current multiverse with. Right. It's a template. <clears throat> right. Exactly. And should they decide to follow his plan and do so, that's the only way to survive the destruction of all the multiverses that's currently happening. 
but it would involve having this reality overcome that one. And in this reality, they've imprisoned literally every single person who didn't agree with that plan on a horrible giant apocalypse planet. Right. (laughs) (laughs) That is exactly what's happening. And in the real world, uh, Starman, that's his name, right? Starman? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Queen of the Seas. Yeah, Mira. Mira. Uh, they're, they're fighting Mrs. Plucklick, who, uh, who has turned himself all gigantic. Uh, Jaro's helping out, kind of. He's uh, mostly shooting the one-liners out, uh, right. being a kid. <laughs> Jaro, like stealth MVP of the series. <laughs> so stupid. But, uh, every like... time they need something, Jaro's the man. <laughs> like, just the idea that Jaro is able to go on to mm. mix a split like and like get any kind of reading. That's true. Like I feel like impressive. the power levels between a fifth dimensional lamp and literally any being that exists within the third dimension should be like of an order of magnitude that would render Jaro completely ineffective. <laughs> but right, drooling on the floor. But I'm totally okay with the fact that they right, represented the destruction page. of reality by uh, showing the art break down into the blues and pencils line art. Right, and even a, a broken pencil. Right, even the Dekamuk pencil <laughs> is there, which it's trying to write reality, but the pencil is broken. Like, that's a, that's a twist on the, the pencil of the author within fiction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, that's all uh, pretty okay. And uh, obviously, the heroes are not okay with the idea of imprisoning anybody who uh, would potentially be against this world creation before they've even come out against this world creation or know anything about it. You don't uh, imprison people for crimes they haven't committed yet. Right. Except Batman. <clears throat> yeah, Batman's into it. And I hated that. Which is, Yeah, it's weird because not only does he die, but he's not the type to just imprison people forever. Yeah. He's into rehabilitation. Right. Yeah, he's not the kind of person who's going to lock up every... Not even just the criminals, but literally everyone who would disagree with this plan. Like, Batman is literally Mm -hmm. the one who would most disagree with that plan. This is true. I hate that. uh, Yeah, so terrible representation of Batman at the end there. And then the heroes, because they don't agree, get sent over to this apocalypse world where Lois Lane is the, uh, I guess, prison guard, and we'll find out more in the future. Yeah, Warden Lane, looking real real dark. <laughs> so this is a little weird issue. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, it's like it's unraveling again, you know, Justice League. It pulls it together for a couple issues, and then it all unravels. I agree, 100%, mm. and I think it's very notable that this is an issue that James Tiny in the fourth had no cover credit on. Oh, well, that's true. Once again... If it's Snyder and Tiny, and you're probably going to have a more coherent story. <laughs> it's almost like just Snyder having to like mm. explain his story to Tiny or however it works, and it's like just talking through it makes the story a little better. Yeah, I could see that being true. Yeah. Anyways, I give it a five. A five? Yeah. Yeah, I think five. No, nah, I, th- I liked it a tiny bit better than War of Realms, so I'm going to give it a six. All right. Yeah, on that, uh, the art. The mm. Menace art is awesome. Uh, the World Forger looks really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's the one. He's a little less... <clears throat> excuse me. He's a little less hawkish than uh, I remember. I really hope that they get into the ins and outs of exactly how, like, this World Forger relates to the World Forger we saw in Metal. That was definitely just Carter Hall. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought. It looked exactly yeah. like Hawkman. Right. <laughs> Okay, uh, moving on to the weird one for the week. Uh, this is definitely one I wouldn't have picked up if it wasn't such a light week, honestly. Yeah. Um, the first issue of Major X, uh, written by and drawn by 90s comics aficionado Rob Liefeld. Liefeld. However you say his name, I think it's Liefeld. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a really big hype issue on the internet because Rob, of course, is the creator of Deadpool and Cable and Domino and Shatterstar <laughs> and all of these characters that are now big movie stars. Right, and they all show up, too. And they all, every single <laughs> character, he's famous for writing, shows up. Um, and it's mostly about how Major X, this mysterious <laughs> dude from the future... Because that's what Lee Field does, is a mysterious dude from the future. Yeah, but, like, it's not the future. It's, a like, future. a sideways possible future, maybe, that's being destroyed. Right, it's like a some sort of mutant utopia dimension. <laughs> right, that but, was created by mutants. For right, mutants. and he talks about these uh, X things right. that are these... Hel- 
Leafield the clearly ex- thought these were hilarious ex puns. Yeah, the essential, and uh, there was there was another one that uh, uh, like essential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was another one. We're gonna see what the essential is essential in the next ex- issue. Um, oh man, H- uh, Hank exists as Beast in this dimension. Oh, he's called McCoy. McCoy, like he's a member of the Shi'ar for some reason. Yeah, um, he's all white. A- a- acts nothing like Hank, in my opinion, for whatever reason. So why yeah, not it be true. Hank? But he's okay. real different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's interesting because it's a lot of like the characters yelling the plot at each other and yeah. at us, the reader. Right. And uh, now, isn't it weird that this uh, Major X uh, he looks a lot like Dread? <laughs> Yes, it's very much a Judge Dread style helmet. Yeah, and then we get this Deadpool shows up, but wait, he's not Deadpool, he's Dreadpool. Right, he's Deadpool, but shoulder pads. But shoulder pads <laughs> and a utility belt. Right, which is almost like uh, Rob making fun of himself, since he's known as the shoulder pads and pouches guy. That's funny. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's scattered and weird and high energy and lots of action. And Deadpool shows up to fight Dreadpool, and there's a motorcycle that can drive you between dimensions. Uh, the mother bike. With a mother bike. Kind of like that bit. Which is, it's, it's a little, like, mother box. It is a lot like mother box. <laughs> um, and then the reveal. The reveal that Major X is uh, Cable's son. Which is just hilarious. Cable's ethnic son. His ethnic son. Uh, questionable. At first I was like, wait, maybe he's just tan. <laughs> no, no, he's definitely... Uh, He's half black, or he's half Latin. He's half something. He's half something. Um, and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm your son, and you're our only hope. And, yeah. It was fine. It was <laughs> such a Rob Leefield comic. It was so everything that that dude is known for. Just, like, stuff happening. And slightly weird art, because the art is simultaneously good and bad. <laughs> You can tell everything that's happening. The action is well directed. Like uh, it, it all works. The costume designs are there, but everybody looks a little stiff. And like whenever somebody is pictured where one of their arms is behind their body in some way, the back arm looks like a little shorter than it should. <laughs> and, and, and it's just weird. It's just weird. But I kind of enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it's not fun. It's like trash comics but it's not trying to be like <laughs> high level comics in any way it's literally just trying to be like this is what comics were do read this again well here's a comic um so it's all right i would give this one a five exactly average yeah i'd also give it a five all right moving on so we have issue uh, 16 of the immortal hulk ali and joe bennett as always yeah 18 um, and uh yeah so Hulk has been, uh, man, I forget what happens in this issue. Hulk is hanging out with Doc Samson, and they're going back to the lab where Hulk was in pieces and escaped from before. Right, right. They go back to that lab. Because Betty's uh, missing. <clears throat> Agent Burbank is uh, still after them. Right. And uh, the reporter the reporter been following them. Uh, she has a little bit more plot. Right, it turns out that her coverage of the Hulk is like has helped the newspaper she works for go national or like get, get <laughs> right. a higher profile, but she doesn't want to write about the Hulk anymore. Like, at least not the modern stuff that's happening. Yeah, she's freaked out. She's freaked out, rightfully so. Yeah, by, but she's by, got it for a job. Um, once again, we have amazing, <laughs> amazing transformations uh, depicted by... It's so gross every time he transforms in this book now. That's true. Um, and every single time, like, your brain is trying to tell you, like, oh, Hulk is splitting between Banner and Hulk. Right. <laughs> because in every previous Hulk comic, you know, it's always just been like, oh, he gets big and green and tears his clothes. This is the transformation. And yeah. then sometimes they'll get split and it'll show a split. But in this, like, no, he ain't splitting. Like, it's just the grossest transformation you can imagine. Yeah. Like, it's Hulk is coming out of you at any point that he can and then absorbing you back into him. <laughs> that is an interesting... Yeah, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, pretty cool when they uh, find the lab that uh, they go to, and there's some monsters in there for Hulk to fight, and he he, he enjoys that. And he gets to mess up some monsters, some good action. Yeah. The, the evil company mm. is bathing the corpse of Rick Jones in some sort of 
goo that's coming out of a gamma radiated heart that they have in the lab. Yeah, and then they smother uh, the room that Hulk and Samson are in in ultraviolet radiation uh, along with the uh, regular light spectrum. Yeah, super bright light. Super bright light. Sunlight, basically. A uh, facsimile of sunlight. So that turns him back into Banner. Which, uh, once cool again... Angle. Gr- gross transformation. Banner gets, like... He, he's all elongated for a second. Like, this one I super thought was them being split into two people. Right. Because it seemed like, oh, they turned on a machine and now they're just separating them. Right. But, I mean, they have the separation plotline already, so I really need to stop thinking about happening. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But he doesn't turn him back into Banner, really. Right. But here's the thing. And Burbank's there to, uh, to, to kill him now that uh, he can't transform into nighttime hulk but uh then banner laughs and he says uh i, I ain't banner <laughs> hey i got some news for you big shot i ain't bruce banner and the name the the name of the issue which has in all these issues we get the the name of the issue at the very end yeah it's joe man joe that's uh that's a gray hulk man that's joe fix it mr fix it the hulk that is a more devious it's the you know the the Vegas bouncer Hulk. Oh, okay. He's he's the the problem solver Hulk. He's the the the, the super the, the 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 low life able to work with the gangsters and get things <laughs> done. Hulk. Joe, fix it, baby. Look at those gray eyes. Yeah, gray eyes and that a, facial and expression. Shit eating grin. <laughs> I love it. It's Joe. It's Joe. Yeah, uh, pretty enjoyable comics. Uh, Immortal Hulk has a high standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I give it a seven. I give this one an eight. All right. I, I liked it a lot. The art is knocking out of the park on every page. I really want to know what Betty is freaking turned into because we see her on one page, uh, seemingly overlooking the police. That I think this is her looking at the police investigate her house, and she did not turn into a Hulk. Right, no, she turned into some kind of uh, red bird thing. Yeah, she's like a harpy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll see what that's about. I'm very interested in what has happened to Betty. <laughs> okay, we're going to round out the reviews this week with the second issue of Cosmic Ghost Rider Destroys Marvel History, um, which this is, I guess, the Spider-Man issue, whereas the first was the Fantastic Four issue. Right. I liked this issue a lot more than the first one. This one had a lot more laughs. It had a lot more laughs. And you want to know why that is? Because Spider-Man comics lend themselves to humor in a way that the Fantastic Four doesn't always unless you write them correctly. Well, that's true. Reed and Sue ain't that funny. Oh, they're scientists. (laughs) Um, I mean, Peter is too, but... He's funny. The man having the the first pages where it's uh, recreating that scene from the original Carnage uh, crossover. Or the one where, I'm sorry, not the Carnage crossover. The one before that where Peter uh, goes to the island to face Venom and uh, lures the symbiote over by stripping down and saying, You want me? Come and get me. But all the dialogue has been changed slightly to be very suggestive. Right. The (laughs) innuendo. It's a... Euphemism. Quite funny, I thought. Um, (laughs) And then, yeah, we get all these pages of uh, old Frank Castle uh, being Peter Parker's good buddy throughout many of Spider-Man's greatest adventures. Um, and good buddy is uh, a loose term. Right. Manipulative uh, accomplice, yeah. more like. Uh, <laughs> which I really enjoyed the part where he attempted to prevent the clone saga from a- ever happening. Oh, yeah, that was fun. By just spoiling everything the second Ben <laughs> Riley shows up for everyone <laughs> and killing the Aunt May imposter that sets the thing in motion. Right. Like, well, you didn't have to kill her, did you? <laughs> she was definitely going to die in a couple of pages, like in regular <laughs> continuity, that lady. Because uh, that's how it goes down in the original Clone Saga. So of course. We can kind of uh, give Frank a pass for murdering that woman. Yeah, I guess. Kind of. <laughs> um, I didn't love it when Doctor Doom shows up because he was in the air to go to a climate change conference. Oh, I know. Uh, and then uh, uh, Mary Jane's comment, that like, oh, and he, he can do it, but good regular folk can't. Yeah, yeah, that was a little preachy. That is preachy. <clears throat> um, but I did laugh out loud when uh, Frank was asking the detective guy who's secretly the Sin Eater why he has a picture of Nick Fury in his office, and the dude's like, yeah, I used to be in S.H.I.E.L.D. And he's like, yeah, I used to be a pizza delivery guy, but I don't have a framed photo of my boss in my office. <laughs> my old boss. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> um, true. So, some pretty good laughs in this issue. I should have said that it's by uh, Paul Shear and uh, drawn by uh, Todd Nauck. Um, 
So yeah. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty pretty good. <clears throat> yeah. All the old style, all the stuff that happened in the past is done in an old style, which is nice. Yeah, I like the use of like the sort of a uh, textured colorization for all of the art to indicate the flashbacks versus when Frank is actually talking to uh, his wife and kid. Yeah, it's um, much smoother. So pr- pretty entertaining. I like it better than the first one. I'd give this one a six. Yeah, I'd give it a six as well. And that does it for this week's comic reviews. Thanks for listening, everybody. And we will be back with more comic reviews in the very near future. Take it sleazy.